Good evening. Welcome to all of you who have joined us in person or via Facebook Live and Zoom. For those of you who are here in person, please take this moment to ensure that your cell phones are silenced. We begin our Wednesday evening service with a pre-service meditation. So I invite you all to get still and close your eyes as we play the God's the Love That I Am chant. You may choose to chant along with it or simply follow along silently, repeating this mantra to yourself. If your mind wanders, simply bring it back to this mantra, God's the love that I am.
And so as our meditation comes to a close, gently bring your awareness back into your surroundings, into your bodies, and as you feel ready, open your eyes. Welcome to those of you who have joined us while our meditation was in progress. We're so glad to have you with us virtually or in person. Let's begin with our opening chant, God is in this place. Hello, everybody. God is in this place. God is in this place. God is in this holy place. God is in this place. Love. Love is. Let's join together in prayer, knowing that God is truly in this place. We are here tonight together to know the truth, and that feels really great, to know that God is present in all of our lives at all times. There isn't anywhere that God is not. And because I know that's the truth, I know it's the truth for me, and I know it's the truth for every single person in this place. I know that life is love, I know that life is joy. I know that life is goodness. And I know the truth for this service, that it is truly love, that it is truly inspired. And Reverend Sidney is just what we need to hear, the message that we need to hear for us individually and as a whole. We know that it is exactly what we came here for, this beautiful, wonderful place. And because I know this is the truth, I'm grateful. And I say, thank you, thank you, thank you. And I release my word into this perfect law. And so it is. And together we say, Amen. Amen. Please join me in saying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the glory, glory forever. Amen. lately can't hear it have you heard the news do you ever wonder if there's something you can do mm -hmm. be the change you want to see now's the time to let it be starting here and starting now Trust your heart to show you how you can be the change. If you want to see a change, you got to be the change that you want to see. Oh. Plant a flower and 
watch it grow You will reap what you sow Put that smile on your face And make the world a better place You gotta be the change If you wanna see the change You gotta be the change That you wanna see to live in harmony yes making music in a universal band yes we can every tribe and every religion in every land we can live together yes we can pretty much don't need to say anything. Uh, that, did you write that? Wow. Wow. Yay. Thank you. Hey. <laughs> hello, hello, hello. February 2nd. You know, I saw my own shadow today, and it looks like six more weeks of me being a hot mess. <laughs> All right. Ah, this month starts Black History Month, and on the 30th, we began this period called Season for Nonviolence. Now, the tradition of that was that it started some time ago through the Gandhi, Gandhi Foundation. Arun Gandhi, who is Mahatma Gandhi's son, um, started this. Actually, I believe he's his nephew. Now I'm just making stuff up. Anyway, but it's good, isn't it? All right. But the idea is that it commemorates the period of time in between the day that Gandhi was assassinated and Martin Luther King was assassinated. So it's 64 days of nonviolence, peace and nonviolence, and also bringing in to the practice the um, the concepts, not just that those two men taught, believed, and lived by, but also such people as Rumi, Thich Nhat Hanh, and Cesar Chavez. And so it's been really interesting looking at the ways that we can begin to cultivate those qualities and those ideas into our lives and really make a difference in the world because we want to be the change. And I know that when I hear that phrase, it, it ennobles me. It makes me feel, it, it lifts me up. It inspires me. And, and yet at the same time, I want to be able to have something of a little bit more specificity about what that might look like. What does the change look like? Um, and so I have been looking at all of this and one of the things I actually came upon tonight, just before I walked out, was 
this book from Bishop Desmond Tutu that was in my office when I inherited it from Reverend Mark LaPonce, and it's called God Has a Dream. And I really want you to hear this. It's just the introduction. It's part of it. And I, it, ta it just it touched me. Dear child of God, I write these words because we all experience sadness. We all come at times to despair and we all lose hope that the suffering in our lives and in our world will ever end. I want to share with you my faith and my understanding that the suffering can be transformed formed and redeemed. There is no such thing as a totally hopeless case. Our God is an expert at dealing with chaos, with brokenness, with all the worst that we can imagine. God created order out of disorder, cosmos out of chaos, and God can do so always, can do so now in our personal lives and in our lives as nations globally. The most unlikely person, the most improbable situation, these are all transfigurable. They can be turned into their glorious opposites. Indeed, God is transforming the world now through us because God loves us. And that is the whole idea about this idea of be the change, how do we be the change? It's that this change, as we teach, as we know, growth doesn't happen to us, change doesn't happen to us, it happens through us. We create the space for it or we create the, the receptivity and sometimes we don't have the receptivity and we have to change anyway. We have to grow anyway. Last week I talked about that where Dr. Mark has, has spoken often about if we do not initiate growth, then growth will initiate us. So when we become available to the greater possibilities, when we listen to the urgings of our soul, when we begin to hear that there's a, a change in the song that's being sung within us, we can take that as the cue that we are being called, we are being prompted to grow, we are being prompted to, to expand and to stretch. So. I want to tell you about my real world experience about being the change. This is the funny thing about, about ministry. You know, when you choose something to talk about, you get to, live, you get to live it. And so last night as I was leaving the church, um, I got into, it was, it was dusk, so it wasn't full dark, but I got in my car and I did everything I do, seatbelt the whole thing, and pulled out of the, um, the drive, drive there onto... Um, Irwin, and immediately, immediately, there was someone behind me honking, 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 and flashing their brights, flashing their brights, flash. And I thought, wow, that's interesting. What's going on there? Now, I was in a pretty good space because I'd been at church all day and working on things. So I only judged and, you know, condemned this person a little bit. <laughs> so I, I am happy to tell you that I, I did shift pretty quickly. To, uh, to a place of compassion and curiosity. See, curiosity is like a superpower. I really believe it is, and it really works for me. You know, I felt compassion for this person who obviously thought I was doing something wrong, and I also got curious about just what was going on here. So, curiosity is my antidote to criticism and my antidote to snark, right? Now, now, again, I go to my judgmental place, and I did last night for a little bit, and I was critical of how this person was probably driving way too fast in a residential zone, and didn't they see it was coming from a church, and come on, what's your problem anyway? And then I, you know, I breathed. And I remembered that I have the capacity to choose curiosity over criticism. And when I do that, by the way, I immediately calm down and become well, at least similar to a human again. I become a vehicle for engagement, not enmeshment. I, immer I engage with what's possible and move out of the enmeshment with my ego and my judgment and my snark. And the biggest gift in becoming curious for me is that I also get to choose deliverance over drama. 
You know, think of the Lord's Prayer and deliver us from, I like to think of ego, <laughs> deliver us from error, from ego, from judgment, from criticism, from all of that stuff. And when we allow ourselves to be lifted above those things, our, 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 our judgments, our snarks, all of those things, we, we move beyond the drama. And then we have an opening and we have possibility. So these ideas, curiosity, not criticism, engagement instead of enmeshment, and deliverance, not drama, free me to stop attaching to my need to be right and righteous. So I continued with this path of curiosity. What was going on here? Why did this action of me pulling into the street infuriate this driver so much? And why was he still flashing his brights at me? So this is making my husband very nervous, by the way, who's sitting right here and he's thinking, oh God, our insurance. So when I got on the freeway, it was almost dark and I noticed that I couldn't see the panel on my dashboard and I was kind of chilly. I wanted to turn on the heat. I thought, well, that's weird. What's going on? And then I remembered that early in the day when I was driving to church, there was a lot of crazy traffic. I like to call it frogger because these people are just like driving all over and they're zooming there, they're zooming there. And I always think, well, I want to make sure they can see me. So I turned my lights on. Um, and then when I got to the church, I had not, man I, I manually turned them off. And then when I got in my car last night, I didn't even think about it. So here I was pulling out of the church parking lot onto the street and almost on the freeway with no lights. Well, no wonder this person gave me a gift. Happily, that person was okay and I was okay. If I had, but if I had stayed in that critical enmeshed and drama self, I would have created a whole huge, huge thing in my mind, you know, and I, and I would have in it, it would have anchored in separation, you know, blood pressure, heart rate, all of that stuff. My ability to be the change for anything other than bad behavior would have been totally sabotaged. Now, when I take a breath and reconnect with my divine nature, I remember who I am and I remember who you are. When I take a breath and reconnect with my divine nature, I am living in the infinite realm of God. I'm living in God. When I take a breath and reconnect with that divine nature, I return to wholeness. I become a channel for peace. I feel peace. I breathe peace. I know peace and I vibrate in that field. And when I'm in that conscious vibration, I become what we call here in this teaching, a mental equivalent of peace on earth because I am being that peace. I am literally and spiritually being the change. So Ernest Holmes brilliantly, brilliantly talked about the mental equivalent, about being the space of availability, of possibility, of equivalency for that which we wish to see happen, that energy around that thing. Um, Neville Goddard talked about it too, in, in, and so did Wayne Dyer, in which we become, we connect with the emotion about that thing already being real, already being so, already being fully present and expressed. And we begin, as we teach in this beautiful teaching, to prepare for that demonstration. We prepare for it. We create the availability, we create the, the field of possibility. We create all of that. So God as spiritual law is infinite and limitless. However, you and I limit our expression of the infinite by thinking that we are only capable of the finite. Mm. So we don't necessarily stop to remember that there's a mental equivalent or that we can create. A, so the mental equivalent, by the way, isn't a hard and fast thing that you, we look it up in a book, you know, I want to become this, so what's the mental equivalent? No, this is something that we do emotionally in which we engage with our imagination, with our feeling. How does it feel to be peaceful? Oh, that's peace, mental equivalent. How does it feel to be loving? Oh, mental equivalent. How does it feel to be healthy? Okay, remember that, healthy, flexible, fluid, at peace, ah, mental equivalent. 
So if I think I am finite, then certainly I'm not going to be able to extend my thinking into a place of believing other people are infinite. I will limit my interactions. I'm going to filter my interactions with them, and I'm going to keep them in a place of finite control, perception, and understanding. And yet Ernest Holmes wrote this, our individual use of spiritual principle can only equal our individual capacity to understand it, to embody it. We cannot demonstrate beyond our ability to provide a mental equivalent of our desire. And this is really important. We cannot demonstrate beyond our ability to imagine that this thing or idea, whatever it is that we want, is possible for us. And what it will feel like to have that, to be that, to live as that. When we begin to connect on an emotional feeling level with whatever the idea is, then now we've got some spiritual skin in the game and we get to co-create with God. We get to co-create with the infinite. You know, we, we talk a lot about prayer, and yet so many of us, I think, still think about prayer as something ab about that thing that we want to get as opposed to that presence that we want to let, that knowing of letting. Are we praying to get? Are we praying to let? And Ernest wrote, prayer does something to the mind of the one praying. It does not do anything to God. God has already done everything that it's going to do and that it is, is supposed to do, which is to be fully available. The whole teaching of Jesus was based on a theory that is done unto us as we believe. And as Ernest wrote, that is, it's measured out to us according to our own measuring. Oh, man, right? If, we, if our belief is limited, only a little can come to us because that is as we believe. Let me say that again. I just really messed that up. If our belief is limited, comma, only a little can come to us because that is as we believe. We call this, again, the law of mental equivalence. And how much life can you and I experience? As much as we can embody. How much change can we experience? As much as we can embody. How much peace, wholeness, health, financial well-being, physical well-being, as much as we can embody. You know, the idea is that we want to become congruent with our desires. We want to become congruent with the law of good, the law of God. We want to be congruent with the infinite. If we are incongruent, if we are out of alignment with that, then we are working against ourselves. We are working against the law. We are working against spirit, and there's no opening. There's no possibility. So we cannot work in doubt and fear. We must begin to do the deeper work so that we can begin to live in opening and possibility. So when we think about this as much as we can embody, my thought was how much do we want our world to be a loving, peaceful, inclusive, and welcoming place as much as we can embody? How much of the qualities, those loving, peaceful, inclusive, welcoming qualities, can we populate and animate animate with our own feeling and imagination. You know, we have to move beyond just simply talking about it, verbalizing it, but to feel what that feels like. What does loving, peaceful, inclusive, and welcoming feel like? When we're willing to practice, live, and by the way, own our responsibility in creating love and peace, inclusivity and welcomeness in our personal daily lives, and we become we literally become the active shift in this infinite field of possibility. We raise the consciousness of the world. We raise the vibration. It, it is, we, we participate in the collective, the race mind, and we raise the level of love, of peace. We become the change we wish to see in the world. We become the change. You know, these concepts and these principles and, and, and ideas that we teach they feel really, really good, but unless we use them, we're missing the point, right? Ernest Holmes wrote this too. Prayer does something. Oh, I already quoted that one. Never mind. <laughs> copy and paste, copy and paste. We need to commit going beyond the conceptual enjoyment of what we teach to the actual practice and application of what we teach. 
I like to explain it this way. You know, we have these services on Sundays and Wednesdays, and, and it feels really good. Uh, people come in or they tune in, and, and while we're in the activity of the service, it feels great, right? We feel happy, we feel joy. But what happens is a lot of us don't go beyond that experience, that one or two hour experience of feeling good in the moment. As we're there, the endorphins are flowing like crazy. But after that experience of, of energy, enthusiasm, possibility, and community, life kind of seems to return to status quo, right? Like you leave the parking lot and life goes back to status quo. It's like, to me, it's like going to Nordstrom. You choose something to try on, you go into the dressing room, you put it on, you admire how you look, you really enjoy it, and then you put it back on the rack so you can come back again next week and do the whole thing over again. Who does that? A lot of us, when it comes to, to a spiritual practice or a community or a church, we come for a while, we feel good, and then we, we go. And we think, well, that was nice. Hmm. All right. Next. So we live in that realm of status quo. And this is what status quo might look like. The news is scary. Your relatives are annoying. Your own physical or financial health might be scary. But this teaching is about so much more than temporarily escaping the status quo for a brief intermission of denial and fantasy and wishful thinking. You know, Ernest Holmes created this teaching in order for us to feel good longer than just an hour or two. He created it so that we can literally change our lives for the better permanently and in an ongoing basis. So we continue to grow in possibility. We grow in that change. We grow in that love and that life and that celebration. The greater knowingness of who we are as divine, infinite creations of spirit. But if we are not, take a breath here, doing the spiritual and mental work, then don't be surprised if you have a tough time being the change that you want to see in the world. It's pretty literal guidance. Be the change. You and I must be different. We have to be different. It starts personally. And none of this is a criticism or a condemnation. It's about when we set an intention, we have to actually, you know, participate in the intention. We have to be a part of it. It's easy to look at others, whether they're family or political leaders or what you, you people on the news or, or neighbors and believe that there's just too much work to do or that they're the problem. Really, they have to be the problem. How could it be me? I, I don't discriminate. I, I am nice. I'm courteous. I hold the doors for people. I don't judge. I, I've never judged or restricted anybody because of their color or ethnicity. I'm a really good person. I'm not part of the problem, except that I am. We all are. Edmund Burke nailed it when he said the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good people to do nothing. We must engage with life. We must engage with what is happening, but we must do it from a consciousness of knowing ourselves as infinite love, infinite peace, infinite possibility. You know, you and I are here now. We pressed through at this time for a reason. You know, this is, we're in this universe, this universal perfection, perfect order, creation, sustenance. You know, the planets still in their orbits, the tides rising and falling. We are not here randomly. We are part of the ordered expression of God. We are here to do the work of loving, of growing, of changing and teaching. We are here for each other. So there's a lyric in a song I like a lot. It's actually based on a quote um, from an English theologian by the name of John Wesley. I'm going to give you the chorus from the song because it's, it's very fun. And the chorus goes, um, Do all you can with what you have and the time you have and the place you are. Do all you can. And the whole song is all about that. Do all you can. And here's the original quote. Do all the good you can by all the means you can and all the ways you can and all the places you can at all the times you can to all the people you can as long as ever you can. 
Now, John Wesley said that in 18th century England well over 100 years ago. Well over 100 years ago. Pretty enlightened. I believe that we all have the capacity to extend ourselves in such great compassion. But we have to be willing to choose curiosity over criticism. We have to be willing to choose engagement over enmeshment. And in the simplest terms, can we choose deliverance over drama? You know, these habits are addictive. The habits of criticism, enmeshment, and drama. We like to feel that adrenaline flowing and the cortisol rushing through our limbic system. It's, it, you know, it's, it gets us going, it gets us moving, and we feel like, okay, I'm alive now. But here's the thing, that's not inspiration. That's simply not, that's adrenaline, and adrenaline isn't inspiration. If we are to have peace and loving wisdom as our true north on this journey, we have to disrupt the addiction to a struggle narrative. We have to disrupt our addiction to a struggle narrative. The struggle narrative looks like Instantly reacting in anger when someone honks at you and flashes their brights. It's addictive. Again, adrenaline and cortisol. The struggle narrative shows up in our collective assumption that there isn't enough, someone else is different, that there's an other trying to take my good from me, and in the belief that change, that's interesting, can't come, especially through a path and a practice of peace and nonviolence. So do you know why we stress meditation and spiritual practice so much here? It's because it does create within us a mental equivalent of God. It creates the mental equivalent of God. So we know what that feels like. We know who we are in God as God. We know what love feels like. We do it for collective periods. We do it maybe five minutes a day, 10 minutes a day, 20 minutes a day, so that we can know and begin to grow and nourish this mental equivalent of God. When we know and feel that peace and that presence and the wholeness and the equanimity, it is so much easier to be the change we wish to see in the world. Because now we've got, we've got a mental equivalent. We've got a set point. We know what it is that we're trying to do. So this week, as we begin honoring this whole idea of the season for nonviolence, please consider choosing curiosity over criticism. Choose curiosity. Get curious about your reactions. Get curious about your anger. Get curious about what's going on. It will lift you from, it'll lift you from judgment and shame, and put you into a place of real possibility, real possibility. Consider choosing engagement over enmeshment. When we engage with each other with our own reactions, as opposed to being enmeshed with our ego and our fears and our angers, we have a dialogue that we can have with ourselves and then begin to expand it and take it forth into the world. And consider choosing deliverance over drama. Be delivered from the drama. Be delivered from your own drama. Thank God I recognize my drama and, and can be delivered from it. I deliver myself from it. I, I have great compassion for my husband and my son because they know my drama well. And I always, always want to remember to choose deliverance over my drama. Be the change. Choose to be still and know that you are God. Let's pray. Oh, so we take this time recognizing that indeed we have not just observed spiritual principle, but we have chosen to engage with it. That we have not just simply regarded the infinite presence and power that is God, but we recognize now that we are part of that. 
we identify with God, we identify as God, we embrace that knowing and truly live from a greater awareness of what the word one means. One with, one of, one as. I know that we are fully connected in God, fully connected as God, and that there can be no separation because this, this infinite loving presence is the, the truth. It is the only truth of us. It is the, the most high truth of us. There is no other truth about us. We are that in expression. And nothing and no one can stand in the way of it, including us. So I know for us now that we choose curiosity over criticism. We choose engagement. We choose deliverance. We choose love. We choose wisdom, intelligence. We choose peace. We choose infinity. For right where we are, the presence of God is active and alive and expressing as that which we want to have experienced in our lives. So I know if there appears to be a need for financial wholeness, that God is active right there. If there appears to be a need for physical, robust health, for vitality, God is fully active and expressive right there. If there appears to be a need in the realm of relationships, in the realm of any area of life, I know that that area for all of us is filled with God, filled with good, and nothing and no one and nothing in this world can take the place or block the experience, the expression, the activity of God because God is all there is. So we allow this knowing, this experience ah, to be that truth which fills every aspect of our thinking, of our lives, of our knowing. And we are fully available to rising up and to seeing each other as fully risen, fully embraced and fully cherished by God and as God. And what a blessing it is to know this. How wonderful to know that we have this, this, this presence within us and this power which is inspiring us, which is guiding us, which is leading, which is absolutely energizing every activity of our mind, every activity of our thought, of our imagination, so that we might live in that kingdom of God, that kingdom of heaven, right here, right now, right here, right now, right here, right now. Right now. So I invite you to say with me that I accept these truths for myself and all beings everywhere. Let's say it again. I accept these truths for myself and all beings everywhere. And in that acceptance is great gratitude. There is great gratitude and great love and celebration for we know it is already so. This treatment is the demonstration. We are simply recognizing that which is all ready so. So I say, and so it is, and together we say, amen.
<laughs> All right. So we are going to do our affirmative giving now, our grateful giving. So if you would simply take your offering and hold it to your heart and say with me, from the love of pure spirit within me, I bless this gift. I send it forth to heal and bless and prosper. It is evidence of my faith and belief. It does good work in the world and returns to me multiplied abundantly. And so it is. Well, I'm making a commitment to be the change this week. I'm doing it. And here are the announcements. For all the ways you can make donations to our church, go to ncnhcrs.org slash give. Prayer with a Practitioner is available after service in person and on Zoom. Wednesday evening service with Reverend Sidney Steen, February 9th. The meditation is at 6.50 and the service is at 7 p.m. Reverend Sydney's topic next week is Season for Nonviolence, The Courage to Dream. Women's group. This group will meet this Sunday on Zoom only at 11.30 a.m. Practitioner Liz Racy will be the special guest and will be teaching American Sign Language and Chants. Zoom link is on nhcrs.org. Men's group. This group meets this Sunday at 11 a.m. in the Ernest Holmes Room and on Zoom. Foundational class with Dr. Mark Vieira starts Tuesday, February 15th on Zoom only. This week, this 14-week life-changing class is the first in a series of Centers for Spiritual Living sponsored core curriculum courses and is open to everyone. Students undertake their first formalized step in understanding the church philosophy and teaching based on prayer, meditation, affirmation, and spiritual mind treatment. Sign up on our website. Annual meeting, Sunday, February 27th at 11.30 a.m. The annual meeting is for members of the North Hollywood Church and will be held in person and on Zoom. The Zoom link is the same link used for our Sunday and Wednesday services and can be found <clears throat> on our website. We look forward to seeing you there. We would like everyone to please join us in consciousness that we will be able to return to two services on Sunday, March 6th. Yes, we will, yeah, yay. Yes, we will continue to Zoom and Facebook Live our 945 service. And yes, we will have our junior church at the 945 service only. And a few more things, Zoom virtual patio, before and after Sunday and Wednesday services, Zoom meditation every morning, Monday through Saturday at 8 a.m. 
Visit our website, nhcrs.org, to obtain Zoom links and more information about all our events and to sign up for weekly e-blasts and monthly newsletters. And now, Reverend Sidney will give us our benediction. I love the idea of coming back to two services, right? So it'll be 9.45 and 11.30, just like we remember, only, wow, what a brand new world we are in, right? All right, quickly before I close this out, I want to acknowledge that we have some virtual and in-person support here. And thank you all of you online who have joined us and you're staying with us. We are so grateful to you, and I want you to know that the practitioner holding vigil online is Gail Palat. Our Facebook Live support is Liz Racy. Our Zoom support has been Alma Alvarez, Mark Kroll, and Reverend Nadine. And so they are just nailing it. It's so much fun. And in the sanctuary, let's see, lights and sound, Adam Keshen, yay! <laughs> Greeter and usher, Colleen Butler, yay! Our media team today was Doreen Remo, Brenda Jordan, and Blair Thompson. I don't think Nikki's here, right? Nikki is here. Nikki Savara, who just had a birthday, by the way, yesterday. Happy birthday, Nikki. Tina Meeks, thank you, thank you, thank you. You can get her music at tinameeks.com. And Sam Krieger, our superstar superhero, thank you so much. Carrie Herrera, ministerial student, pulpit support. And oh, I'm Reverend Sydney. Thanks for coming. <laughs> Let's pray out. So what a sense of gratitude and delight that we have, that we've been ever able to connect with each other and to connect with that deeper truth within, that right where we are, God is, and all is well, all is great, all is perfect, all is wonderful, whole, and seeking expression through us. So how wonderful that we have been able to acknowledge possibility, acknowledge change, to acknowledge growth and to love all of it, to laugh at it, and to midwife each other onto that next step in our journey. So I'm grateful for all of this. I am grateful that this time together is fruitful. And I know that as we go forth into the world, we continue to be blessed by it. And we are indeed a blessing to all, all who cross our path. And so I'm grateful, and I also know that not only is this church the blessing, but we bless every church, every ashram, every sanctuary, every, every mosque, every temple, every synagogue, wherever people gather. We know that the power and presence of God is seeking to shine, and we declare that it is good and very good, and so it is. Amen. Thank you. Blessed always, blessed always For the arms of God surround